All right, I'm going to take a photo of you all. Smile, cheese. Cool, thanks. Uh, hi, welcome to my talk about accessibility. Uh, the guy at the back is going to tune the sound. Can everyone hear me? At the back, good. Um, it's my first time in Vancouver, it's awesome. Who, who's been here before? Who, who's been in Vancouver before? Yeah, it's, it's the most amazing uh, scenery. Uh, I'm going to be talking about accessibility. Uh, I'll try to pack quite a lot in. Uh, there's probably not going to be time for questions. If you have nasty comments to tweet, please include me so I can read your nasty comments. My Twitter handle is at Dylan Barrel. Um, I love JavaScript. I, I, I went to Redbubble and ordered this uh, hoodie just for this conference because I wanted to show you guys how much I love JavaScript. But uh, so I was uh, on the internet, which is obviously when you go somewhere, if you really want to know what the truth is about something, you go on the internet and Google stuff, right? So I was trying to figure out what would JavaScript be if JavaScript was animate or a thing or a person or something, right? So I went on the, the internet and I found some kind of interesting stuff. I found out, first of all, not everybody likes JavaScript. Um, this is a leftover salad or something. Uh, it's the first thing you find if, uh, if you say uh, Google JavaScript as a person or something like that, you'll find this. And for those who can't see, it's, um, I think it's a cancerous growth with eyes all over the place and stuff. Um, you know, with, a, with, with, say, with one of the faces saying, I'm technically functional. Um, so I thought there must be better, there must be better personifications of JavaScript than this. So then I found somebody who said it's like Ginny Weasley. It's the language that cries when all the other languages get to go to school, uh, get to get on the train to go to school. <laughs> I thought, that's not really nice. JavaScript is a lot better now than it was when I fell in love with it, which was quite a long time ago, to be honest. Um, so yeah, no, so I didn't like that. So I went searching some more. And then I found one that's not too bad, at least. <laughs> it's like Tyrion Lannister. Uh, and the, the uh, rationale, rationale behind this was, well, it's kind of, all, you know, a little bit strange, uh, but gets a lot done. I thought, yeah, I like that a lot better. That's cool for JavaScript. But that was about an hour and a half, two hours of searching. I wasn't really that, you know, I wasn't happy, so super happy with what I found. So I thought, well, anyway, we don't, those of us who are in here, probably if you're in here, you don't write just back-end code. So when you're writing applications, you're writing them with the triumvirate, of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, right? So I thought, OK, let me make up my own personification of these three things together. What would I call these three things as a kind of a personal superior or something if, if, I, if I could? And so I thought, ah, it's Deadpool. Deadpool is a perfect personification of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And the reason is because these three technologies together were really created to be super robust, right? They were created in a, in a, to, to uh, live and, and be able to work in an environment where the network could go down at any time, some resource that you were pointing to could disappear, and that's what Deadpool, Deadpool you ca cannot die, right? He can't even get drunk. His, uh, his body just uh, processes and fixes itself so quickly that, uh, that he can do whatever he wants. He can chop his arm off, he can get shot and, and, he, and he never dies. And so JavaScript applications, HTML applications in a way, are kind of like that because, you know, if, you, if an image doesn't load, doesn't matter. If your CSS doesn't load, doesn't really matter. Your application might still work. If your, if your event handler crashes, well, doesn't matter. Uh, that part of the app might, might not work, but the other parts of the app will just carry on working, right? So actually, JavaScript and, and HTML and CSS apps are pretty robust. Uh, and that causes problems as well as um, it's, you know, good things. So what's, for example, what's the upside of not being able to get drunk if you're Deadpool? Well, um, if you go to like Moscow or something, I've been to Moscow a long time ago, uh, one of the, one of the, all, I know this is a super overgeneralization, of course, but one of the things that they tend to kind of seem to place a lot of self-worth in is how much vodka you can drink before you fall over, right? So when you go there, I remember I was on the train from Moscow to, to Irkutsk, and there were these Russian soldiers in the, in the cabin next door, and they invited us to come over and, and eat some, some of their dried meats and stuff like that, and they brought out three bottles of vodka. 
And it's like, we're not going home until these three bottles of vodka are finished. And we finished them, and then they went looking for more because I hadn't fallen over. They're like, we, we need to make this guy fall over before we stop drinking. And while they were out, I went, I went in the cabin next door. But Deadpool will beat all the Russians in any drinking competition. That's the upside of that. So what's the upside of having these applications that can break and you can't even really detect that they're broken? You can look at an app and it's like, is this app still working? Well, you're going to have to go through all the functionality to actually really figure out whether this app is broken or not. You, know, you can't rely on the compiler. You can't rely on the, you can rely these days a little bit more on linters. But really, to test all parts of your application to make sure they're working with every single build, you actually have to really test them. So that's the upside of the fact that we have these really robust te technologies where if a tag doesn't work in a browser, it just throws it away, right? Is that we ended up with some pretty cool tools now to help us test these things. So Selenium came out of uh, the necessity to really end-to-end uh, -end test applications before you put them into production because you can't rely on anything static uh, really in the JavaScript world. And there's only a few up there. We have so many cool tools today to help us uh, solve these, uh, these different problems. It's amazing. If I think back to when I started programming, uh, okay, we do a lot more complex things today, but all the tools that we have today, uh, it's really quite amazing. So what does all this have to do with accessibility anyway, right? Well, I was also kind of thinking, if accessibility was a thing, an animate thing, what would it be? And I came up with, well, I think accessibility is kind of like Mewtwo. Anybody here play Pokemon Go? Yeah, Pokemon Go. Go blue team. <laughs> um, uh, I tried to capture that gym out there. I did capture it, but like literally five minutes later, the red team came and took it away from me again. Anyway, why is it like Mewtwo? Uh, why is accessibility like Mewtwo? Because Mewtwo, for those of you who don't really know Pokemon that well, has this ability to just go, become invisible, right? So it can become invisible, disappear, and you have to try and catch it if you're playing Pokemon Go, but it's invisible. And accessibility is really like that because not only is it built on top of those three technologies that you know, can break and you won't even notice it? But now when you uh, take a lot of your other tools and techniques for testing applications and you try to do that with accessibility, the stuff that you rely on uh, sometimes just doesn't work. So if you're a developer and you're testing your thing and you look at it and it looks fine, uh, it might actually be broken from an accessibility point of view. So let me give you an exa a couple of examples to, point, uh, to, to show you how this works. This is a, an example of a simple sign-in form with sign into your account as a header or something, a user ID and a password and a login button. Um, I actually didn't make this one up myself. I actually got this off the Mozilla Developer Network website when they, I, th I think it was an example for a login form or something. This is the markup of that application there. And so nothing super amazing about them, but they're actually using a field set, which is kind of cool from an accessibility point of view. Um, got a legend for that header, and they've got this uh, the input field, uh, the two input fields with their labels. But the interesting thing, really, I wanted to point out here is they've decided to use an input type equals image for the button. And they've done everything correctly, so they've put this alt equals login onto the button so that somebody with a screen reader can come and they can actually de determine what this image button is for. And so it's, it's cool, it's accessible. And what happens if we take the alt attribute away? Somebody comes along, modifies the code, new version of something. Uh, now, what does that look like? Well, it looks exactly the same. So accessibility, a lot of accessibility things are like that. They're just plain invisible, if you will, I'm using air quotes for that, to those of us who who can see or have, you know, who don't have particular types of disabilities and who don't use particular types of assistive technologies, right? Another couple of examples just to show you the types of things that can happen. Uh, if you've created a, a, a menu bar with menu items in it, maybe it's got multiple levels of, of pop-up and you've implemented all the, the cool keyboard interaction uh, in, with JavaScript handlers and all of that cool stuff using ARIA, um, if, what you've done, if you've done it correctly, is you've added role equals menu item to each of the individual menu items. You've also added a tab index of zero or minus one if you're managing with JavaScript to the, to the list item to actually make it tab focusable. Um, and those two things are super important right, from an accessibility point of view. If the tab index isn't there, for example, then somebody using a keyboard won't be able to get to that element. 
Uh, but if the tab is, is there, but the menu item isn't there, then somebody using a normal keyboard will be able to interact with it, but somebody using a screen reader won't be able to interact with it because the screen reader won't go into what's called forms mode, and so that the JavaScript events won't get delivered to, to the uh, event handlers. So those are two different examples. You can go and maybe test, oh, I'm going to be cool. One of, the, one of the things we tell uh, developers, the first thing you can do uh, if, if you're going beyond the stuff I'm going to talk about uh, later, if you want to do some manual testing, use a keyboard, right? Go into your, your, your system with a keyboard and test all your functionality with a keyboard. That's great, but if you left that role equals menu item off there, you, you're, you're actually still inaccessible to screen readers. So if any of those things disappears at any point, of, point in time, or if you misspell menu item, because that's a common thing with ARIA, is people misspelling roles or making roles up. Like, is it role equals IMG, or is it role equal image? Um, uh, you know, so, uh, so it's a very common thing. Uh, and another example is one below, where you've got a label and, a, and an input, and there's the association between the label and the input using 4ID association. If you get one of those wrong, or you misspell one of those, or somebody goes and takes one of those off, some, somebody changes the HTML, then the thing that was accessible breaks, right? So, um, so what we've done at, at DQ is we've created a library that can pretty much find 50% of these. The, the library's name is Axcore. It's, uh, I'll show you a little bit later uh, how you can get hold of this different library. But the cool thing about this is in our, in our tests with large organizations, for example, we were, we were at a large um, insurance organization, State Farm, we, we tested 65 different applications. We did full automated tests and full manual tests of 65 different application pages. Uh, we found that 50% of the, of the uh, accessibility issues could be found using the full automation, using this Axe Core library. Um, and so that's huge. That means that you've got a pre-built kind of test-driven development library that will go and find all these sorts of problems for you. What will it find? Uh, it'll find if that alter attribute disappears off that lo login image button. It'll find if you misspell uh, ARIA roles or you use ARIA roles that don't exist. It'll find if you are missing uh, things like parent-child relationships in ARIA uh, roles. So ARIA is kind of um, complicated, and so a lot of the errors that it finds are er uh, errors related to, to ARIA attribute misuse, ARIA role misuse, and that sort of thing. Um, it'll find a lot of form-related uh, errors, uh, missing labels, that sort of thing. Um, and one of the most important things that it does is it te it'll tell you when you've used a feature that might work in certain browser assistive technology combinations and do doesn't work in all of them. So one of the, the, the things we do very st uh, strictly uh, in, this, uh, in this project is we make sure that we test and we repeatedly test to make sure that all the ARIA attributes, all the various different techniques actually work. So that if you use them, we'll tell you if it passes Axcore, we'll, then, you, then you can be pretty certain that it'll work uh, on Android, it'll work on iOS, it'll work on, in, in IE, it'll work in Firefox, it'll work in Chrome, it'll work on Mac OS, it'll work on Windows. Uh, those are kind of the platforms, the core platforms that we, uh, we, we support. So we do a lot of that testing, we bake that knowledge, uh, into the library itself. Works in any browser. Uh, it's fast and lightweight. And when I say that, I, I say we put a lot of effort into making it fast. Paul Irish has actually helped us quite a lot with the performance of the latest release, of, uh, the 3.x release, uh, which also added support for Shadow DOM. Um, and so it's got, it's got really, really fast. It's, it, it's slow if you've got huge, huge pages with uh, 30,000 elements on the page, and it's going to be a little bit slow for certain things. But in, in general, it's really fast and lightweight. It's also the only library that supports Shadow DOM, uh, supports cross-domain iframes, uh, which is also very important, um, and open source and free. And we've just added, for those of you who, who know accessibility well, we've just added our first rule that adds some support for WCAG 2.1, which just became a standard uh, a couple of months ago. So I'm very excited about that. So how do you get hold of this? Well, we, have, we currently have two extensions. We have a Firefox extension and a Chrome extension. You can go and download them from the stores. Um, they're pretty cool. Uh, I like them because they, uh, first of all, they're very simple to use. There's a big Analyze button. You just press that Analyze button, and it'll analyze whatever the state is of that application at that point in time. Now, that's kind of important because if you've got a lot of content that may show height based on interaction uh, with, the, with the page, uh, then it's not going to test, even if that content is there, say, 
uh, in, in uh, display none state or some other state, it's not actually going to test it. It's going to not test that. And the reason for that is, is important because uh, and, and a lot of the attributes that are, that are important for accessibility don't get applied to the HTML unless it's actually displayed. So we make sure one of our focuses, one of our big focuses on zero false positives, because we want you to be able to take this library and embed it into your um, continuous integration build, into your functional tests, and rely on the fact that if something breaks, it's actually an issue. So by making sure we're not testing that display none content, we're also eliminating a lot of false positives that you would otherwise get. So it's, it's kind of important. So you press analyze for whatever state it is you want to you wanna analyze, and then it brings up a list of results on the left-hand side. Uh, those are the rules that are failing, so it groups them by rule. And then it gives you a count for that, and then you can filter it. So we, we do show you in the extension, we show you best practices. Uh, we, we, uh, um, we also show you what we call needs review items. Now, if you're using the API, you can, you can very easily turn the, uh, exclude those uh, because they show up in a different place in a different way. But in the extension, we, we, we show you some of those things so you can determine, do you want to actually adhere to the best practices um, or do you want to just deal with the violations? So you can filter those so it shows you only the violations, for example, and, and, and doesn't show you all the others. And then you can uh, inspect the details for each of those issues. It'll generally show you the HTML element and the source code that's, that's being, uh, that's, it, it, that, that has the problem. It'll tell you all the various different tests that it, uh, it applied to try to see if that element passed in some way. So for example, for an for a input field, there are about five different ways you can label that input field. And I'll tell you, I tried to look for a 4ID association, I tried to look for ARIA label, I tried to look for a title attribute, etc. I'll walk through all those different things and I'll tell you, those are the things I tried and I couldn't find any of them. It also has one of the most important things, a more info or a learn more button up at the top right there, you can see that. And if you click that, you get to um, a website that we maintain and we keep in sync with the rules as the rules change, as we add new rules and as we modify them, which gives you a lot of help if you don't understand and you're trying to figure out how to fix this issue. Um, it, it, it's the DQ University, DQ University is the name of their website, and it generally gives you information about why should I care about this? Why is this important? What sorts of disabilities are affected by this problem? Um, and, uh, and that sort of information. It'll tell you what the algorithm is. It'll also give you, um, in a lot of instances, different ways that you can actually fix the problem with sample code. So there'll, there'll be, for the form uh, label uh, example here, it's giving you all the different ways you can actually fix this with different markup or different techniques. It also points uh, and links off to a lot of different courses you can take on our DQ University side. That's kind of why we do this for free, is we try to entice people to sign up for our, for our courses which aren't free. Uh, but it also uh, points you at uh, W3C and other reference material that is free as well. So there's a lot of links from the site out to other information as well. Okay, so that's how you can get hold of probably the, the place I'd recommend you start is with the extension. The other place you can go to get, uh, get hold of this and leverage this technology is to go to NPM. Obviously, my big, I love NPM. Uh, it's great. Um, so we have a bunch of different modules. Axe Core is the core library. You just npm install, uh, dash dash save dev, uh, Axe Core, and it'll pull down the library. And then you just require it or whatever you want to do, however your favorite method, uh, method is for getting that in. And if you've got a functional test that does some uh, functionality, so you've got a fixture and you apply some functionality, you do some assertions on that functionality in that functional test, all you need to do to, to test that state, that end state, or any given interim state of the UI for accessibility is to call axe.run and pass it the part of the, the document that you wanted, to, uh, or the web page that you wanted to analyze. Now you can either analyze the entire web page by passing the document, or you can say, I just want you to look at this modal dialog piece of the page, right? And Axe Core is intelligent enough that it knows when you pass it the entire page, it's gonna turn on the rules that are what we call page level rules. So page level rules are, exa for examples are, do you have headings on the page? If you have headings on the page, do you have the he correct heading structure? Do you have, um, uh, is all your content on the page inside what's called a landmark region? Some of those are best practices, some of them are real violations, but those are, the, are examples of rules that apply across the entire page. Uh, and it'll only turn those rules on when you pass it the entire document. 
If you pass it just a, a section of the document, it'll only run the rules that are relevant for snippets of code. Uh, so that's kind of also important to reduce uh, false positives. You don't want, if you include this into your functional test and you run it in your CI environment, you don't want to break in the build because of some kind of false positive. And then you can just do an assertion on the violations, and that's uh, exactly the same as if you say uh, show any violations in the, uh, in the extension. So there are other projects if you don't have a lot of functional tests, and as surprising as it is, given that the, what I talked about having Selenium available and a lot of those other testing frameworks available, there's still a lot of teams that don't have, either from a legacy perspective, they don't have functional tests, and you still want to use AxeCly, then there is um, a way you can do this. npm install AxeCly, it's the command line uh, uh, interface for, uh, for Axe, and if you do that with minus G, it'll actually create an Axe command that you can run from the command line, and if you run it, I'm running it against uh, uh, npmjs.org, it'll basically go, uh, it uses WebDriver, it'll load that, uh, that page up, it'll wait for the page to finish rendering, it'll inject Axe Core into it, and it'll print out a list of the issues that it finds with that. So this is something that's very easy. In fact, we had uh, a partner who took this and he built a whole website around, uh, it's called Rocket Validator, just around the Axe Cloud where you can actually run uh, this against multiple pages, and it'll go and spy to your pages and stuff. And it gives you the same information. So here you can see, or maybe you can't see because it's kind of an eye test. Uh, so violation of heading order with three occurrences. It's, it's got the selectors for those occurrences, so you can find them on the page if you want to, and it's got, once again, a clickable link that you can click to get off to that DQ University inf uh, More Info page. So the same kind of information, a little bit uh, con uh, condensed, that you get inside the extension, you get inside your output for your AxeCly as well. So this is something you can embed into Jenkins, Circle CI, uh, et cetera, and run against your pages if you don't have a lot of your own automated tests. Uh, another project that's, uh, that I like quite a lot is ReactX. Uh, and what ReactX is, is it's a library that you include into your um, uh, React application in your kind of development uh, environment. How many people here use React? Hi. I love React. It's awesome. Thank you, Facebook. Um, and this is what, what it looks like. So it, what it does is it actually prints out the information dynamically as you run your app. So when you first load your page, you, you open up the dev tools, you'll see the output from the analysis of ReactX and it analyzes the entire page. Then, as you interact with the page, it'll pick up the changes that are occurring and it'll run them dynamically against those, just those changes on the page. Um, and what it does is it actually dedupes uh, these issues. So if it's found that issue against that element, uh, it won't report it again as you're going through the page. So you only see new issues uh, pop up as you interact with your application. So it's kind of a different way of doing it, uh, but it's kind of cool. You can use, you can use Axcore um, in your, your, your Jest tests and your Enzyme, uh, you know, th those sorts of things as well. Uh, the problem is, a little bit of a problem, is uh, they're running with JS DOM. It's a little bit slow. And there's uh, one or two, I think it's one or two rules that you have to turn off. They don't work in JS DOM. So this, so this gives you an alternative if you want to get bigger coverage than that. Then, the, I, I can't go through all of them, but there are a bunch of other Axe projects that are maintained by us. Axe WebDriver IO is one. Axe WebDriver JS is one. For those who are interested in uh, Java, there's Axe Selenium Java. Uh, there's also X uh, matches for Ruby. Uh, so depending on which language you, la languages you use, there, there are uh, quite a lot of bindings for that. Uh, there are also a lot of community projects or projects from third parties. So Axcore is actually embedded into your audit tab inside uh, the Chrome DevTools. So if you open up Chrome DevTools and go to the audit tab and run the accessibility test, that's actually Axcore running under the, uh, under the hood. That's, wh that's why we got... Uh, uh, Paul Irish to actually help us with Axcore is he, he, he was one of the developers working on that. Uh, Microsoft Sonowall is also based around Axcore. Uh, Ember, there's an Ember Alley testing uh, um, library that was developed by LinkedIn. Uh, Pally is a pretty, pretty popular open source um, accessibility testing tool. And they've now added uh, a plugin where you can run the Axe rules instead of running the code sniffer tools. Uh, rules, which are, so the, the rules are much better. There's an Axe Puppeteer um, project that was started by somebody else. 
And there's, there's much more. I, I, can't, I can't list all of them here, but there's quite a lot of them here. And if any of you are interested in contributing, uh, we're, we're definitely interested in having more projects and more integrations. Um, so what, what's coming next? Uh, we're continually uh, developing uh, the, the acts. It's very actively maintained. There's a lot of bugs that we're fixing. Uh, we are trying to improve the performance all the time. Uh, for this, n the next 12 months or so, there's going to be a lot of improvements in rules. We're, we're going to try and implement more WCAG 2.1 rules. As we've implemented the CSS object model inside the engine, and now we're going to add some rules that can test some CSS object models, uh, do some, use the CSS object model to do some kind of cool testing on WCAG 2.1. Uh, we, we are currently playing around with ideas of how we can uh, take Axe Core and make it work in a static linting environment. So doing like an ESLint uh, type integration is something we're working on uh, right now. Uh, there's an exciting project that's coming out from one of our partners who may or may not be a sponsor here. Uh, they're going to be, be uh, sh showcasing that to us middle of October and then uh, releasing it publicly. So I'm really excited to see what they're actually doing. Uh, with that, but they've been working on that, pro on that project for over two years, about two and a half years, so it, it's, it's probably going to be pretty cool. And then there's uh, Project Walnut, which is um, us being able to take, take the Axe extension and add some functionality on top of it that go beyond fully automated testing. So if any of you are using the Axe extension today, uh, stay tuned because there's going to be some opportunities for, for you to participate in our early beta program in that. So you, you'll, you'll start to see a call to action pop up uh, probably in about a, a month for people to participate in that, uh, that Project Walnut um, uh, early beta program. So uh, that's all. How can you con uh, contact us? Go to AxeCore. We really um, welcome contribu contributions of all sorts. Uh, whether it's documentation, whether it's telling us about a project we don't know that supports Axe. We try to uh, maintain a list of all the projects that are using Axe. Uh, if you want to come in and help us with some new rules, uh, every contribution is welcome. Uh, if you want to tweet at me, at Dylan Barrel, or if you want to follow DQ Systems, we do quite a lot of uh, information, a lot of blogs, a lot of uh, webinars about accessibility. At DQ Systems is the Twitter handle to follow if you want to. Uh, be kept up to date on that sort of stuff. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much.